a few brief minutes talking about the phosphate mineral group. In the textbook, the phosphates are pages 427 to 430, which is a really short amount of pages, considering there's over 760 different phosphate minerals. But most of those are actually pretty rare on Earth. They don't have much geologic significance. Uh, there's a few that you'll hear of, like turquoise, monazite, wavelite. But here, we're actually only going to talk about apatite as the only mineral to actually write down in your notes. All the phosphates share one thing in common, and that's this molecular unit that is one phosphorus and four oxygens that bind together in a tetrahedral arrangement and have a charge of three minus. Okay, so that is our basic structural unit of the phosphate mineral group. Of the 760 though, there's only one to discuss, and that is apatite. The chemical formula for apatite is actually pretty easy, and I'm gonna even make it even easier for you. What you have to memorize is that it is a calcium phosphate with OH, chlorine, or fluorine. And this is probably one of the more significant things about apatite, is that it has this um, this unit that's attached to it, and it's not all of, well, it can actually be all of these. I'm going to do this. Let's say this, they can be all of these in some kind of solid solution, or if you have like 100% OH, then it's called hydroxyl apatite. This could be chloroapatite, or if it's fluorine, it's fluoroapatite. And in fact, most of the apatite you would deal with, at least from an igneous or metamorphic point of view, would be fluoroapatite. So I'd like you to know that that's the most common. Our mineralogy for apatite, well, what, how do we anchor this? We always say the hardness first. So this is five on most hardness scale. Its specific gravity is heavier than most minerals at 3.1. When apatite crystallizes, well, shoot, I should show you some pictures, shouldn't I? Yeah, let me insert some pictures here as we're going through this discussion. Bingo. So this is a good picture right here to base your general understanding of apatite mineralogy. When it crystallizes, it forms hexagonal prisms, like you see in that picture. And it tends to be, well, I guess you could say a yellowish green, right? This is kind of a yellowish green here. It can become brown. So the most common colors we're going to see are yellow to green. And then when it becomes less value, it, I guess from a mineral specimen per perspective, it can be brown. Blues are possible too, but this is what I want you to picture when, when you picture the color of normal crystalline apatite. The other thing to talk about is that apatite does not have a good cleavage. In fact, it has a very poor cleavage. So when it breaks, it almost looks just like irregular fracture. And I guess we could say it's also resinous to vitreous in terms of its luster. Those are some good keys for identifying crystals of apatite. Now the geology of apatite is shown here because this is a, diff a different variety of apatite. It's the microcrystalline massive variety that's associated with life. In fact, if you were able to zoom in with your eyes like a microscope and look at this more closely, you'd see that the irregular kind of texture of this is actually a bunch of dead organisms of fossils. So we're going to say here is geology. There's two main occurrences for apatite. One is as hexagonal microphenocrysts like this here in igneous or metamorphic rocks. So let's go ahead and put that first since it's briefer. Hexagonal microphenocryst. And when I say microphenocryst, I just mean kind of crystals that are smaller than the average crystal. In fact, they can be really small, like 100 microns across. In igneous or metamorphic rocks, meta rocks. And in just a minute, we're going to introduce what this means. This is this is a new geologic occurrence that we haven't talked about yet, and these are called accessory minerals. So we'll let this be your introduction to accessory minerals, and we'll talk about it more in just a bit. Now the second main geologic occurrence has to deal with the death and decay of living organisms. And this kind of appetite is called colophane. Col-o-phane. And this is an example of what colophane looks like. And what it is, it ends up being this massive variety. Right? And by massive, I mean uh, granular. So it's this granular variety commonly associated with biologic processes, specifically the process of death. Commonly associated 
with biologic processes. And what it'll do is it'll forms uh, sedimentary beds. So let's go sedimentary beds. And what ends up happening is that the, the death and decay of marine organisms, or even you and me, could create a positive phosphorus because things like bones, teeth, shells, they have a lot of appetite in them. In fact, our teeth, human teeth, it's something like 70% of our teeth are made up of colobane variety of appetite. So when this does create a sedimentary bed, we will enrich that with phosphorus plus minus calcite. That's the other thing that's going to be occurring in these sedimentary beds. The significance of when you find large deposits, sedimentary beds of colophane, is that it is very important for fertilizers. So let's go here. Significance of appetite is primarily for fertilizers. We need fertilizers because we need food, right? And, and, and most fertilizers are made up of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And this nitrogen is coming from ammonia, and this potassium is coming from sylvite, a mineral we talked about earlier, and the phosphorus, that's coming from appetite. So that's it for appetite, but what I do want to do is now talk about this idea here of accessory minerals. So let's make this kind of a okay, star, and we're going to call this general occurrence. And I think this is general occurrence number three, because we talked about hydrothermal systems earlier in the year, and we talked about evaporite sequences earlier in the year. So our new general occurrence is called accessory minerals. And the way an accessory, accessory mineral works is that these are minerals in igneous and metamorphic rocks. So these are going to be uh, minerals in a crystallizing directly from a magma in an igneous rock, or they're being changed in by the process of metamorphism in response to plate tectonics. So it's in either one of these two rocks. And what ends up happening is that there are elements that cannot fit into the crystal lattices of normal minerals. We call those normal minerals the rock forming minerals. So here's an example of a granite that is someone's countertop. And in this granite, there are feldspars here in white, and there are uh, quartzes here in gray, there is biotite here in black, and there's actually a little bit of garnet here in red. We'd consider things that are occurring at less than 1% of the entire rock an accessory mineral. So let's say this. We're going to say less than 1% of rock. And what these minerals do is that they, they hold, let's say this, the minerals hold rare elements that don't fit into normal rock forming uh, minerals. In fact, they're so uh, low percent, they also tend to be so small that we can see them with the naked eye very rarely. And in fact, what we need to do instead is look under a microscope, like in this picture right here. In this picture under a microscope, we've got quartz, We've got some more quartz, we've got some more quartz, and then these kind of brown to green, these are all biotites. So that's some biotite, here's some biotite, biotite, biotite. And there are really tiny crystals, much smaller, right? Look at the scale bar down here. On the order of 10, 50 to 100 microns that are our accessory minerals. And here's a prominent one. That's a zircon crystal. And it's holding the zircon that can't, or the zircon, conium that's in the magma, but that couldn't fit into quartz or biotite or feldspar. We also have here and here, we've got some titanite, not a mineral you're going to learn this semester, I don't think, but that's an accessory mineral. And then we also have here and here, apatite. So that's holding the phosphorus that was in the magma that couldn't crystallize any other place. So just the last thing I want to put down here is that these tend to be small. On the order of, let's say, 10 to 500 
microns across. That is general occurrence number three. And before this lecture is over, it's time to talk about general occurrence number four. And that general occurrence is going to be called detrital minerals. And we talked about these with gold and with diamonds. We've used the word placer before to describe this occurrence. So this is called general occurrence number four. And this is going to be called detrital minerals. Now, any mineral that erodes from its primary rock source and doesn't just completely disappear is technically a detrital grain. And so something like sand in this picture here, all this material here, that's just grains of sand. That's all detrital sand or detrital quartz. But usually when we say the word detrital, we're talking about the rarer stuff, like this black mineral, which is probably magnetite and ilmenite that are being enriched by the flow of water. That's usually what we mean when we talk about detrital minerals. Same thing could be here. There could be little flecks of gold throughout this, and that would be detrital gold, also known as placer gold. So I'm going to just go ahead and put the word placer here because we used that term earlier in the semester. And the detrital process is fairly simple, and we'll define it here. Minerals eroded from source. Minerals eroded from source. and transported by water. into a depositional system. Depositional system. Okay? Like the bed of a river or here like pebbles uh, or are on a beach. There are a couple keys for minerals being excellent detrital minerals and the key is survivability. So survival is key. And so when we have something that can survive, it tends to be hard, like a diamond, hardness of 10. And the other thing that makes survivable minerals is the density, because they will like quickly settle out to the bottom of the creek or settle out behind a boulder on a beach. And so having high density, things like gold, um, would aid in a mineral's survivability. And then the last thing to consider when we are dealing with the trital minerals is going to be um, shape. And because these things are being eroded and bouncing around and weathering, their shape tends to be small, constantly getting broken up, especially the softer they are. And then the other thing is rounding. And rounding is going to correlate with distance traveled. The trital minerals that are very far from their source are going to be well rounded, right? And things that are very near source could still be very angular or uh, beautifully crystalline. So these are the things to consider with detrital minerals, which we're going to talk about a lot next class when we introduce oxides.